This is going to be a highly non-technical talk, um, almost no formulas. Uh, and let me say up front, I don't know very much about big data, although um, I sometimes do feel victimized by it. Uh, it's growing and around and trying to get through it is um, fairly burdensome. Um, this talk is a talk uh, that I put together with my co-author, uh, Roger Stein, who's at uh, the MIT Lab for Financial Engineering. As you can see from the affiliation, that plus risk management, this is kind of a finance talk. And it's not a talk about improved new methods, but more about here's why discipline A might be like discipline B, and why seeing that connection could allow some kind of uh, cross-fertilization that hopefully could elevate all, all boats. That's what uh, the point here. So I gave this talk a week ago um, to a lot of regulators, people from the Office of Financial Research and uh, from uh, the Fed and the SEC and from business schools. And so it was kind of a, a dual audience, um, an audience that knew a lot about finance and probably not that much about data science. And so I'm guessing uh, that I'm in the reverse situation here and that um, many of you are not so familiar with finance, so I'll try and try to modify a little bit uh, and make a few introductory remarks about the kind of problem um, that in the, in the previous talk wasn't necessary at all, the pro problem that we're, we're after. So I think no matter what uh, you do for a living, if you've lived through the financial crisis, you may know, you see that picture of the Dow Jones or the S&P falling 40%, uh, a big drop. Um, but if you're not in financial services, you could really wonder uh, what, this happens to, what this has to do with you, you know, if you're not invested in the market or not following your investments, even if you are invested. And in fact, the, the financial crisis affected you pretty much no matter who you are. And I discovered a very nice discussion of that put out by the Dallas Federal Reserve, which makes the thing kind of personal. This is an article. I've, I've got a bunch of references. Atkinson is the um, first author on the paper. And he estimated the damage in a way that I think can really connect you to the financial crisis. So first of all, a lot of GDP growth was gone, somewhere between 6 and $14 trillion. Your house paid between fifty dollars and $120,000, every single one of your houses lost that much growth to that 40% market drop, according to these uh, Fed uh, economists. Household net worth all together fell by $16 uh, trillion, lost roughly a quarter of its value uh, during the crisis, beginning uh, in 2007, going through the uh, first quarter, end of the first quarter, 2009. I don't know if you remember, if you follow markets, the market had an abrupt turnaround in the second quarter of 2009 when Goldman Sachs had the best quarter it ever had. Um, unemployment. Um, you probably know people who lost their jobs, one in 10 people at the peak of unemployment in the U.S. And importantly, uh, the median duration of unemployment was uh, 25 weeks against more, usually 5 to 10 weeks. And this is a very gross underestimate because what happens is that when people get out of work, they get tracked for a while if they're getting unemployment insurance, and then they stop looking for work and fall off the rolls. So these are just the people they could count. There was uh, a lot of people in trouble from this thing. So um, what's happened? Well, government... Uh, is trying to come to the rescue. Have all of you heard of the Dodd-Frank or Basel III regulatory? Anybody hear of this thing? Um, Dodd-Frank is uh, an initiative that uh, slogged its way through Congress. Uh, it's a Consumer Protection Act, Wall Street reform. It came in in 2010. Here's its mission, is to protect all of us from future uh, downturns and disasters of the kind we just had. I'll read it to promote the financial stability of the United States by improving accountability, transparency in the financial system to end too big to fail, protect American taxpayer uh, by ending bailouts, so on and so on. It sounds all very virtuous. And at the center of the stress test, this is where I come to you, the big data, at the center of the, at the, of the, the Dodd-Frank Act and where it comes to you and to the big data people is stress testing. Stress testing is mandated for large financial institutions by Dodd-Frank. So, so imagine you are a large financial institution and you have many, many portfolios with thousands and tens of thousands, I don't know, countless positions, exotic securities, 
And what you do in a stress test is you say, well, here are a bunch of macroeconomic factors, maybe uh, oil prices, inflation, interest rates, exchange rates, and some of them go up and some of them go down. And here's how, and then you figure out how um, all of those going ups and going downs affect the portfolio, which either suffers greatly or does very well or does somewhere in the middle. You have a criterion. The thing passes and, or it fails. And uh, that's, that's how you decide if the portfolio is a good portfolio or not. And banks and important financial institutions are required to run these stress tests on their portfolios to see if they are adequate to survive disasters. Now, I want to know why there, there's a thing at the bottom. Okay, so the point, a point, is that financial stress tests are used to assess capital adequacy. That means if there's another hit to the market, are banks going to go down? Is lending going to freeze up? Are we going to get into a lot of trouble again? And this, is, this is, comes out of the new regulation. Um, I want to say that these have replaced or augmented to some extent uh, risk measures that made, in a certain abstract sense, a lot of, a lot of sense to me, uh, rather than being a particular scenario into the future, one scenario, how will this portfolio do, how will that portfolio do, risk measures, statistical risk measures, are summary measures uh, over distributions of returns or drawdowns. They're more like assessments that I'm used to. These have gone out of favor, uh, being blamed to some degree for not protecting us last time. So now statistical risk measures are a little bit uh, de-emphasized. A few paths into the future are very emphasized, and there are teams and teams of consultants all over the world putting together, implementing these stress tests for these large banks and other large financial institutions on their enormous portfolios with all these many, many positions. And they have to keep track of the macroeconomic variables and the linking functions from those variables to the positions in the portfolio. And it's, um, it's quite an elaborate exercise from the point, certainly, of data management, of financial economics, and from, from many other other perspectives. So um, here's uh, cartoon number one. Uh, the question is, is putting a number on this going to be of any help to anyone? Is this going to protect us? OK, so in a rudimentary framework, all the data, all the economics, all the linking functions, all the complication aside, uh, a stress tester, from my perspective and from my colleague Roger's perspective, might be thought of as something much simpler, just a classification problem. So you are a bank. You have you know, 30,000 portfolios. I give each portfolio a number. I give it a 0 or I give it a 1, depending on whether it looks like it's going to be trouble or it looks like it's not. And when you do that, in a sense, all of that complication, for at least one brief second, starts to be swept under the rug. Classification problems uh, have a big um, big life in computer science. The output of the stress test then just becomes a simple binary string of zeros and ones. Its length is n, which is the number of portfolios in the world. n is a huge number. n is a huge number. So as a result, you get a huge number of strings, two to the n strings. But conceptually, this is a lot easier to manage. So now I'm doing stress testing, and I can think maybe that all of the, all of the details, all of the financial economic details are somewhere, and I'm just going to be looking at the stress test to see if it's going to work or not based on this uh, simple string of zeros and ones. Now, for me, it's much easier to think of n equals 2 than n equals thousands. So I imagine two portfolios. And it's very clear to me which is the safe one and which is the risky one. Treasury bonds are issued by the government. Um, and they are, at least in principle, default-free they pay very low interest rates and do well in catastrophes. High yield bonds are the sort of stuff that are big bets um, and much harder to predict, much more volatile, uh, much more risky. I'm imagining a world that I have exactly two portfolios. And in that world, since I can have only two to the, two to the n, where n is the number of portfolios, that's how many stress tests I can have, uh, I've written them all down. And stress test number one, whatever it does to decide 
how it's going to get there, it has an outcome. It says both these portfolios are just fine. And stress test two says that both of these portfolios are in trouble. Stress test three uh, passes high yield, OK's treasuries. And stress test four, OK's treasuries, uh, and, uh, and, and says high yields are trouble. So that's all of the stress tests that you can have. And so the question is, which one of these is the best stress test? I'm going to be running lots of stress tests. It has the, these different outcomes. Which is the one that I should use to decide whether these banks are going to succeed or whether these banks are going to fail? Now, a stress test is a rule, maybe made by a machine learning process or some, some, other, some other way. I don't really care very much. But just as there were four stress tests in a world with exactly two portfolios, there are also only four possible outcomes in a world with two portfolios, one in which both portfolios are fine, one in which both get into trouble, uh, one in which high yield's OK and treasury's in trouble, and, and then another one in which those two states are reversed. These are the four possible outcomes. And now that I have a stress test, I've listed all four stress tests, I've listed all four outcomes, I can start giving grades to my stress tests because I had OK and trouble mapped to zeros and ones. So uh, here is the only page with any formulas. Uh, we have um, uh, the uh, evaluate the stress test on a portfolio X in a state of the world F. And we just take the difference, which is either the difference between two zeros, the difference between two ones, or the difference between a zero and a one take the absolute value, and you get uh, a 1 if your stress test agreed with the future outcome, and you get a, 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 a disagreed, and you get a 0 if it agreed. We can, um, for any state of the world, we can take the sum over all the portfolios and evaluate how that stress test did in that state of the world uh, by taking just the error defined in equation 1 times uh, the probability of that portfolio being important in that state. So this is a little formula that lets you assess the stress test not on a particular portfolio in a particular state, but average on average in a particular state. And finally, we get an error. I call it the OTS error, off training set error, of my stress test, which is just the uh, aggregate of the um, errors in the states times the probability of the states. The training set is off somewhere, maybe on data from the past. Maybe I used portfolios uh, from the crisis and their outcomes to train my stress test to see, um, to see how it will do on the, on the portfolios that I have today. But this is, this is a pretty, pretty uh, standard quantity, and it's the assessment of the stress test. This is how I want to assess it. Now, of course, what's going to happen in real life is uh, the stress test will be evaluated with hindsight. And it's maybe how it did when we get to look back. But the fair way to assess it is with the information, the forward looking, with the information we have today when we decide it, when we design it and use it. So it's important to think about the probabilities of the states and the importance of the different portfolios in the different states when you're designing some way to evaluate uh, whether this is a good stress test or that's a good stress test. And don't forget, these things are being used to decide. Uh, which portfolios are adequate? These are these these are por these stress tests are being used to, to to set policy and to say who gets what. Now this matrix um, shows the errors of the different stress tests in the different state of the world. So here um, both S S1 and F1 were both okay, so there was no error at all. Here one said both okay and one said both fail, so there was an error of two, and here. <coughs> Uh, they each disagreed on one. And sec same sort of thing for S2, same sort of thing for S3. This thing's like a little counting matrix. And the row averages are all the same. And in fact, the row averages are all the OTS errors uh, of the different stress tests under the assumption that the states are equally likely. So given that. I don't know which possible outcome is more likely than which other uh, out than any other outcome. Uh, I find that all of the stress tests have the same OTS error. That error was an attempt 
uh, to grade the different stress, stress tests, the average over the different possible outcomes, I find when I give the stress test grades, they all get the same grade. So I cannot distinguish one from the other. The row averages are all the same. So this is not an accident. Uh, this is a consequence of the no free lunch theorems of computer science. And I think the names Wolpert and, and McCready uh, are the two that come to mind. Uh, there's also a particular more recent paper by uh, Lattimore and Hutter that set, set these um, no free lunch theorems up in, in more or less the way we're using them. They're in optimization. They're in search. I'm sure that, that many of you are familiar with them. But the no free lunch theorem poured it over to financial economics and stress tests uh, tells you that, a str um, that unless you know something about the likelihoods of different outcomes, then you are not going to be able to design a stress test what, that's any better than any other stress test. You might as well just be flipping coins or something. It doesn't help you. So um, what do we do? Well, here we have the states of the world again. We have the four possible Fs. Uh, here in the first state, both portfolios are okay. The second state, they're both in trouble and so on. And here are the probabilities uh, under which I cannot choose a stress test. So I have added another row here. And in my row, these are not necessarily the greatest probabilities in the world, but they have some wisdom in them, which is uh, related to what I said earlier. I think a treasury portfolio is a very safe portfolio, and I think of a high yield portfolio as very risky. So it seems pretty unlikely a state of the world where the high yield is going to be OK and the treasury bond is going to be in trouble. That's unlikely. More likely is that the high yield portfolio is going to get in trouble and the treasury bond is OK. And now I, I could have monkeyed with these too. I just didn't. I have these I called informed probabilities because I've, I've used my knowledge about financial markets to set what I think are more reasonable probabilities. So what's a stress tester doing? when he chooses this stress scenario that's got this out sort of outcome instead of that one, what he's doing is taking his knowledge and effectively converting it into a set of probabilities about uh, what's going to happen next. That's how the views are, in fact, expressed by saying this stress test is a better stress test than, than another one. So when you do that, um, here were the OTS errors in the no free lunch case, where they were all the same. No stress test performed better than another. Now I've put in probabilities that were, I will call, informed. And see, the, the fourth one, uh, the stress test that said treasuries are OK and high yield bonds are risky, better watch out for them, that had the lowest OTS error. So it's the best stress test. So I, I feel very satisfied. But um, after I get done feeling satisfied, then I start to worry that I've created a self-fulfilling process. The grading process that I've made just gave me back the answer that I thought I should have in the first place. So I haven't really evaluated anything. So one of the takeaways, um, takeaways is that if you're, it, it's very important to separate the designer from the evaluator. Because at least, that, I mean, that, that's only a, a faint hope of, of getting it right. But that at least gets one set of probabilities in the design and another set of probabilities or many evaluators with different perspectives uh, in, in the, um, into the mix and trying to find something that's actually going to pick out uh, the right stress test. So um, this is a um, comment from the paper that Roger and I are writing. There's, there's still no free, free lunch. But this time, it's the designer of the, of the rules that has to um, kind of supply something. He's supplying or she's supplying some priors about what might actually happen uh, or just agree that none of this is going to do any good at all uh, due to the no free lunch theorems of computer science. It says that if you do not make assumptions, predictive assumptions about the future, you're not doing anything uh, of the slightest value. So um, a stress test designer is implicitly incorporating her, his, or his, his or her views in the design of a stress test. The, uh, the, 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 the designer, the evaluator, explicitly incorporates his or her views in, the weight, in weighting the most important portfolios and the most probable bad outcomes in uh, out-of-sample tests. Even so, even with this separation, it's a challenge to get this right, because 2 to the n is a very big number. 
Now, um, in a previous life, as, as my kind introducer uh, just mentioned, I used to work for a company that built factor models that was supposed to reduce the no dimension of the problem for n equals thousands and thousands of portfolios to a few, um, a few uh, important risk factors. So presume, potentially you could reduce the dimension of this from 2 to the n huge to 2 to the n reasonable. But in our international model uh, at that company, at MSCI, n was kind of 1,500 factors, right? That was as low as we could get it. And 2 to the 1,500 is still a really, really big number. Um, so factor models, which are commonplace um, at trying to find a few important drivers and not deal with each portfolio on its own terms, are a very important part of this process, but uh, probably do not reduce the problem to anywhere near um, a manage manageable size. So um, in summary, uh, stress testing can be framed as a classification problem. Uh, the NFL theorems provide a, uh, a descriptive and possibly even a, a normative framework for stress testing design, interpretation, and I'll also say evaluation, uh, leading to some guidelines, which um, I hope are being adopted. Um, Without information about the future of the economy, uh, and you know, you all know how, how well we've been doing lately uh, forecasting the future of the economy, all stress tests have the same average performance despite the fact these things are being used as part of the determination of capital adequacy. Um, there's no free lunch. The value of passing a stress test is just as, as good as the predictive power of the stress testers priors. And if his priors are crisp, passing a stress test has a direct interpretation as a measure of solvency. If it's soft, it maybe has a, a directional interpretation, um, but it doesn't really, really get you to a good decision of whether a portfolio is adequate or not adequate. And because the space of future possibilities is so large, the performance under a stressful scenario doesn't generalize across portfolios, across time, or across economic states of the world. So uh, here's what happens if we uh, don't get this right. 